All right, here's, uh, here are the ground rules uh, that we're going to follow. We want to keep the tone ironic and uh, gracious. And we're grateful for our Muslim friends uh, uh, being a part of this with us. And uh, we, this is a chance for you to have to ask questions. If you'd like to direct a question to a member of the panel, you may. This is not an opportunity for you to give a mini lecture uh, on your views. We're not here to hear from you. Uh, but if you do need to provide a brief context to your question, that's permissible. Uh, if, if you direct a question at an individual, you may do that. I may give other panel members an opportunity to respond to the question as well, because our purpose is to foster uh, the, the panel's a chance to dialogue about these things. So may I open the floor for uh, questions? Is there anyone who would like to ask a question of someone? Please feel free to. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> um, from what I gather from Dr. Piper and Dr. Moeller, the, the issue seemed to be uh, for you was the formal versus material substance. And I wondered what, just how you respond to that, the formal material kind of question that was brought up. Understand? Um, I'm not sure I understand what, um, how you mean formal material. So maybe can you just say a bit more? Um, well, they were saying our love of God. Mm -hmm. Do we love God? Or, or do we just say in theory that formally we love God? Or do we substantively love the same God? Mm -hmm. um, Okay, yeah, thanks. A um, couple of issues there. Uh, one is um, uh, uh, Dr. Piper uh, rightly pointed out that the Common Word document uh, does, I, as I understand it, uh, talk about our love for God as being the same kind of love for the same God. Um, I. I as, as, as I understood it, when we were drafting the Yale response, uh, we were uh, inviting a conversation about that question. Do we mean the same thing when we talk about love? Do we mean the same thing when we talk about God? Um, without prejudicing the outcome of that. Now, Dr. Piper did find one phrase in the Yale response, which if you take it out of context, he's holding it up. What? Out of context? <laughs> <laughs> where it says it refers to our common love of God and of one for what for God and for one another, which uh, he pointed out to me uh, several months ago uh, when we were talking privately, and I acknowledged uh, of all the critiques we've had through you know the how uh, two years it's been since we wrote that, um, that's the one. If I could go back and change one phrase, that would be the one. Uh, uh, because we did not intend it the way he heard it. Um, and in the Erdman's book, which I hope you'll all pre-order copies of, um, uh, you'll, we have a commentary on the common word, on, on the Yale response, written by the people who were the original authors of it, where we clarify what we meant, and we clarify that point. Um, so we were inviting a conversation about whether we are, we're both talking about loving God. Do we mean the same thing? We were, that, that was a question well, we were What's asking. the clarification? That that's what we're saying. We're not saying, we're not saying we definitely mean exactly the same thing when we talk about love and we mean exactly the same thing when we talk about God. We're inviting a conversation about the extent to which we do or don't mean the same thing. And obviously there are differences within each faith community. The way in which um, Sufis understand uh, love for God and the way in which Salafis understand love for God is not the same. Um, uh, but is it compatible? Well, we could get a Sufi and a Salafi together and they'd have an interesting conversation and we could probably find somebody who would claim to be a Sufi Salafi. Um, uh, at any rate, um, uh, but uh, the, um, John is also raising this question of whether, okay, Jesus says, if you don't honor the Son, you're not honoring the Father. If you don't love the Son, you're not loving the Father. And, uh, right. and if you don't, don't know the Son, then you don't know the Father. And this came up in a conversation he and I had back when this was a whole new thing. And he was saying, uh, if you don't worship the Son, you're not worshiping the Father. And I quoted him a number of texts in the New Testament where, for example, Jesus quoting Isaiah says about the Pharisees, this people worships me 
but their worship is in vain, for their teachings are but the traditions of human beings. So Jesus is clearly saying they are worshiping God, but it's vain worship in reference to Pharisees. Uh, so John backed off from saying, from using the word worship in that context, but he's saying, well, but if you're not honoring, loving, yeah. and knowing, that's pretty empty worship, right? You want me to say something? Go ahead. Um, I don't think I would back off. Um, I would say, so what did Jesus mean? What did Jesus mean when, you know, we've, we've all said, don't take this text without putting this one beside it and asking, what did he mean by that? And I think if he says, this people worships me with their lips, their heart is far from me, in vain, zero is their worship, and then you put beside that, they don't love him, they don't know him, and they don't um, honor him, then worship, the word becomes empty. That's the meaning of vain. So to, to say they worship him is a, is a, is a cipher. It's, it's a non-thing. So I, I, I would just say, if, if I mean what, I want, I want to mean what Jesus means. Good, that's good. <laughs> All right. And, and he uses the words, and I'll say they're, they're doing those things, and they're directed toward a God, and then you say, now what does he mean by that? And I think he's trying to say, it's all in vain in that, and then he says what it isn't. So I, I'm just, I'm willing to kind of leave out Johnner's phrase about it's a different God and leave out uh, the phrase, they don't worship God, and just talk about don't know him, don't love him, don't honor him. That's pretty devastating. I mean, that's now, really devastating. And, that's an important difference. Yeah, now let me, let me uh, as, as John said, right, we can't take this scripture without putting this one next to it. And, and, and asking, what did Jesus mean? And certainly Jesus didn't mean nothing. Vain worship, but he used the word worship. He didn't mean nothing. But um, uh, one of the things I like about John Piper, by the way, is every time I have a conversation with him, I've got to go back to my Bible. Unfortunately, the only Bible I had with me is on my cell phone. So if you saw me going like this during his talk, it wasn't because I was trying to text my wife or something. I was uh, trying to look it up in my Bible. But anyway, um, I, you know, obviously you have a whole slew of texts in the book of Acts and elsewhere that refer to a category of people known as theophobumenoi, which are variously translated uh, worshipers of God in the NIV or uh, God-fearers in some of the older translations. Um, now, um, what exactly does it mean, phobeomai? What does it mean to fear God, to reverence God? Uh, were they honoring God? Um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't use the same verb that Jesus uses in John 5, which is uh, timeo. Um, it's, it's a different verb, uh, for but, um, but they're doing something which in some cases probably is vain, like the Pharisees. But in the case of Cornelius in Acts 10.4, right, the angel of the Lord says to Cornelius, your prayers and offerings to the Lord, uh, to the poor, have come up as a memorial before God. So in some way... Uh, what he was doing unto God in his ignorance and not knowing Jesus was in some way pleasing to God. Now, it wasn't complete, and he needed to learn about Jesus, and that's the whole point of Acts 10. But nonetheless, God did not reject his prayers and offerings to the poor as having utterly no validity whatsoever. Obviously, another interesting example is Acts 17, where the Apostle Paul, who's horrified by the idol worship in the, in the city of Athens, uh, nonetheless finds this temple dedicated to an unknown God, and he says, what you worship in ignorance, I will make known to you. Um, so it, it seems to me that, um, there, there, that, that we have a warrant in Scripture for um, rather than uh, taking the most uncharitable possible interpretation and say, well, your worship is completely worthless and vain, and you know, why even bother, to say, hey, let me see if there's anything positive I can say. Uh, yeah. You know, the Apostle Paul says, men of Athens, I see in every way you are very religious. I mean, you know, if, if they're idol worshipers, what, what, you, what you can't say anything positive about idol worship except that they're religious. He found the one positive thing he could say. And, and I think that is the apostolic example of looking for what is positive that you can agree with. And, um, and, and certainly, in the sense the New Testament uses the term theophobumenoi, I think that Muslims are god fearers or God worshipers or whatever, however you want to translate Do we have anyone else on the panel that would like to make a statement? Yes. Once again, this is helpful in, in seeking to understand what is actually going on here. I, 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 
I don't have access right now to uh, the uh, writings of the early church fathers, but uh, I, I would like to find where Augustine said this. But as I recall, Augustine said that the way one discovers who is the God-fearer is that when the gospel is preached to him, he claims Christ. In other words, sees Christ as the fulfillment of all of his longings and all of his mm -hmm. believing so that, yes, there are god fears. There are the, the, the folks like Cornelius, but they reveal themselves uh, by the fact that when they hear the gospel, they then seize upon Christ and, and mm -hmm. claim him. The, the other thing that, that comes to mind, and, I, and Joseph, I'll just put this out there seeking to understand it. I, I feared that perhaps I had misunderstood the Yale response and uh, you and I had phone conversation, and, and we certainly want to understand each other. And uh, so every time the folks from Yale seek to clarify, I want you to know I'm all ears and all eyes tr trying, trying to understand. And, and thus the, uh, the, the publication of the statement with notes uh, in this uh, forthcoming Erdman's edition, much to be welcomed, and I think you had a hand in writing the notes. I did. Uh, you know, the notes. But it makes it worse, huh? The notes make it worse. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me just read you this thing. It says, even if it is true that Muslims and Christians believe in the same God, they often deeply disagree about the nature and attributes of that one God. An analogy may help, inadequate but still useful. Muslim and Christian disagreements about the nature and attributes of God may be compared to how differently aged siblings describe their common parent or how members of two political parties describe a president of a country. They are speaking about the same person, but they may have very different descriptions and understandings of that person, end quote. I have to say, honestly, that makes it a thousand times worse. Really? Uh, that confirms everything I feared the Yale response was saying. Uh, differently aged siblings speaking of the same parent is exactly the kind of language, honestly, that, that I fear uh, is uh, to the detriment of clarity of the gospel. Thank you. Johnner? Um, it's actually interesting to me, and I was thinking about this, and I wouldn't be surprised I'm looking across the table and I saw the same thing go through Joseph's uh, head in terms of this. We have the exact same dialogue within Islam about Christians and Jews. I mean, like, when, 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 uh, when Al Mohler just mentioned what Augustine said about who are the God-fearing, they are those who, when they are exposed to the truth, then they accept it. We have a similar kind of um, range of interpretation about some verses of the Quran. In other words, who are these people who are those who believe, right, who are described in the Quran, those who believe, who perform righteous deeds, who believe in God in the last day, they will attain paradise. Well, who are those people? Now, a lot of uh, uh, Muslims in their own tradition try to make this something like they are those who when the religion is exposed to them, then they follow that and they follow the law of Muhammad and so forth and so on. But that's not in the text. That's not what it says explicitly. And you have those who say, no, that's not the condition. It's not a conditional statement upon what will they do once they are exposed to the religion. It's what they are in themselves, in themselves, in their, in, as it were, in their own essence. And um, so that's just one observation that I wanted to, to, to add to that. But in terms of... Um, the uh, idea of uh, this idea of formal versus uh, the, the question was originally this idea of the substantive versus the non-substantive formal versus. I still have to confess, and I don't want to take too much more time on this because it, it could it could really go on. You could have an entire seminar on it. But when one says, for example, that the predicate defines the subject, and hence there's really no that's to me is almost. I mean, from the logical point of view, it's a tautology. Yes, the predicate defines the subject. That's what a predicate is. And so when you have the desk, that is the distinction between a subject and a predicate. And I'm just as surprised as Joseph is that the, the metaphor of the parent, actually I had that in the original version of my paper, not knowing mm. that you had done it. The metaphor of one brother who thinks his mother is wicked and evil and the, one, the, other mother, the other brother who thinks his mother is a saint still have the same mother. It's a different, same subject, different predicates. And I, I, and I would, honestly, I'm, I'm still not clear why that makes it worse or how that doesn't somehow clarify the issue. Yeah, Don, I, if I could just pick up on that. I mean, I think that, you know, when you talk about what the same referent is, I mean, if you, logically speaking, I don't think that it's incoherent to say that if you talk about the same God and, and two different faiths say, well, is he omniscient? Yes. Is he omnipotent? Is he omnipresent? I think there seems to be a, agreement on that. Now, are all the senses about that referent the same? Are they the same referent? I mean, are we talking about the same mother? And I think that it's not incoherent to say that we can be. 
we disagree on other fundamental meanings about what the nature of God is. You know, and just anecdotally, as I've talked to friends of mine in the Middle East, when, when there are Muslim converts to Christianity, to a person, they've said that it's not that they felt like that they were worshiping a different God when they came to faith, but they truly began to understand who that God was through the person of Christ. Now, that's certainly not an argument to be made for whether or not they're right. But I think that, you know, we, we talk about the scriptures in clarity, too, in... Um, in, uh, in John, sorry, I'm using my phone too. Uh, <laughs> gee, okay, here. I got it, thanks. Um, when Jesus is talking to the woman, he says at, you, about, uh, at the well, the woman said to him, sir, um, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say people in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. And there's a sense that, that knowing the truth, it, um, it, did, it didn't seem to, doesn't seem to me that Christ castigated her for not worshiping or for not having some understanding of what the referent was about God, but that she had an incomplete and an inaccurate portrayal of what that reference was, what the sense was. And that, that seems to be part, sort of the, the main flashpoint of our disagreement here is just that issue. Because if you make it such that you cannot have a conversation until you already agree on the particulars, uh, um, then it's going to be difficult to move a dialogue forward on certain issues. If the issue itself, though, like John is saying, is about the very nature of the person of Christ, you can have a dialogue on that, and you can talk about it, and it can be healthy, but it's a different kind of a dialogue in one sense. It seems to me it's more evangelistic because if you're going to have to have both parties, not just Christians, agree on what we're saying about the nature of God, the Muslims can make the same assertion, and then we would not have a conversation. So the conversation is built upon coming together at minimal common ground, and it seems to me that first-order issue of monotheism is there, that it at least can be discussed at one level. A couple of, I'm going to summarize and then have another question. I see two issues surfacing that would be uh, fruitful to uh, pursue further. The first is I think there's a great deal of confusion on the panel between uh, reference and meaning. And uh, there needs to be some work done on the semantics of natural kind terms. And I would recommend the classic stuff by Kripke and Putnam because there seems to be a equivocation going back and forth between predicates and subjects and reference and meanings and so on. Uh, and a part of that question that needs to be clarified is even if reference can be accomplished independent of meaning, which, which Kripke argued, um, when you try to discover something about the referent, how much of your description has to be satisfied before you yes. can count as still referring to the same thing? So that's something that needs to be pursued. The second thing that needs to be pursued further is, the, is whether the uh, common word document and the Yale response merely have a formal characterization of God and if so, can a formal principle alone serve as an action guide for behavior? It's been argued in ethical theory, for example, that a formal principle does not contain enough material content to serve as an action guide, so that you can't generate human behavior from a formal principle. Uh, I don't know, I've read, haven't read the document, but that would be fruitfully explored, I think. Now, I think just in the interest of time, let's have someone else, this gentleman in the back, and then this gentleman here. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is a great discussion. I wish there was more time. I, I'm, an, I'm an Arab evangelical. I, I live in the Arab world, involved in theological education. I'm a Muslim friend, we're in this. And I appreciate being here because over there we can't say <coughs> everything we'd like to share. Do you have a question, sir? To share. So, yeah, this is very important. My question is in regard, it's a different thing, picking up on what John Piper said, is in regard to the love of God, the love of Allah. Uh, and it was pointed out. Uh, that uh, his, his mercy, his loving mercy, his, uh, his love uh, as, as being a, a, a thing of it, very much a, a part of his character. Now the question is, there is so much information in the Quran, in the Hadith, in the theologi theological struggle over history about the very attribute of God, attributes of God in that really this attribute of, of love or mercy is really a subset of his power in that if he's merciful, it's not that he is merciful, it's rather that he can be merciful, but he can be the opposite. It's really his choice, it's his will, which attribute to choose. So I challenge this very 
thesis that he's a loving God when there's so much uh, a talk about his freedom not to be even bound to his promises or his, his laws. He is so free to choose which attribute. And then the 99 names of Allah point to, yeah, he's loving, but he's opposite too. He's, he's, a, he's a destroyer. He's a, right, so, so can you forth. summarize your question then? So my question is, you know, what about all that? All right, in, in the, thank you. <coughs> I think that's Please. to me mostly. Can I get the microphone? Sure. Yeah, I think that as I made it clear in what I was saying is that the Quran also says, call upon God or call upon Ar-Rahman, call upon the merciful. Unto him belong the most beautiful names. There is no other instance, there is no other name in the Quran that it says that. The Quran does not say, call upon God or call upon Al-Qahar, the, 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 um, the conqueror. It, does, it doesn't say anything like that. It doesn't say, call upon God or call upon the vengeful. Now, in addition to this, the, um, the way in which the divine names have been understood by Muslims, there is indeed an ontological hierarchy in those names. And that ontological hierarchy gives precedence to the names of uh, love or the names of beauty, um, as they are called. And often you will even find people in Islamic theological thought who will say that, in fact, the names of wrath, and this is part of what I was alluding to, that the names of wrath, the names when we see God as punisher, as God is presented in both the Quran and in the Bible, when we see God as the vengeful, that actually that is a manifestation of God's mercy in another form. And uh, this is why it is that I, that I drew the analogy of the father who uses the stern hand, but that the stern hand may be experienced uh, in a negative way by the child at that time, but it is nonetheless actually coming from love, which is central to the way in which the father is treating the child. And so to try to say that there is Allah and then there are these 99 names, or they're actually, there are far more attributes, they're just 99 names, but to say, and that all of these are equally representative of Allah is not how Muslims see it, nor is it how uh, the, uh, the Quran presents it. And this is why at the beginning of every chapter of the Quran, in the name of God, the loving merciful, the loving compassionate, not in the name of God, the conqueror, the slayer, or anything of those sorts. And no Muslim would actually even ever say that in the name of God, the conqueror, Thank you. or the slayer. John. Um, um, yeah, that's completely correct. And I just wanted to supplement that by saying you, the, the, the exact formulations you were mentioning, this notion, and this comes out of um, what you might uh, call Islamic scholastic theology, which has a much different role within the Islamic intellectual tradition than does theology, as it's called within the Christian tradition. It's a much more marginal and sort of quasi-official, authoritarian type of thing. And yes, indeed, in Asharite theology specifically, there is this notion um, that um, if, God had, if God wills, he could break his promises. That is to say, God has promised felicity in paradise to those who do good. And, because, uh, and, and since he's God, he can break that promise if he wants to. Why? Because he cannot be constrained so as to not make that choice. This really drives a lot of Muslims kind of to the point of annoyance, and it's sort of it's it's kind of the result of a uh, you might say a couple of set of premises that are then taken to their absurd conclusion within uh, within theology. The position, the mainstream position on such matters when it comes to uh, is, uh, the the kind of the mainstream Islamic tradition was summed up by that man I mentioned before, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali. Kalam, this thing I'm translating is scholastic theology, which comes up with absurd sounding things like God could break his own promises, he could be unjust if he wanted to, and so forth, which really isn't reflected at all in Islamic law or in mysticism or in the spiritual life. He said, you need to have someone who practices scholastic theology, maybe one or two people for every town. Otherwise, just stay away from it because it's dangerous and it doesn't provide any spiritual <laughs> sustenance whatsoever. And those kinds of things, again, you can, you can call it the official Ashari position, but it's a bit different in terms of the way it really relates to most Muslims and most Muslim intellectuals, and that's just the, um, and it's really only at one level of Islamic intellectual thank life. Thank you. Uh, here and then here, yes. Yes, uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, 
Actually, as I heard the first part of it, uh, I was very much convinced by what you said. And I heard the other and started thinking, and a, and a question arise, was arising in my head. And that is the idea, as I understand what the project is, is that th there is, we, we worship the same God. We, we, we basically, are, are, that's, the, that's the claim, we, we, that idea. So they're the same reference. Now here's my question. How do we determine if it's the same reference? And let me give you something I think we all maybe would be able to agree on, the law, the, uh, the law of identity, to be able to determine if something is the same thing. Okay, if A and B are the same thing. Leibniz's law of identity. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, we're trying to determine if I'm Randy Rodden, which I happen to be. Uh, I, I was born in the Midwest, okay? I taught at the International School of Theology in the 80s. I taught at California, or, or Colorado State University. I have a master's, University of California, Riverside. I have two children. One of them's named Ashley. And I'm the distinguished professor of philosophy at Biola University. Does anybody know who that is? Is that me? You don't all know me, some of you know. This person knows who that is. That's not me. There's only one thing that's different. All those are true about me, except I'm not the distinguished professor of philosophy at Biola University. J.P. Moreland is. So here's my trouble with the project, is to say they're the same God means they're the same reference. There are things, many things, that are the same. But if I, if I, if I maybe I don't understand this, and there's something you can clarify, but if there's something I can show about A that's not true of B, they can't be the same thing. Can I, say can I take that first? Uh, um, Don, why don't you go first? Yeah, you know, I, I, thank I don't you. think thank it's, you for your question. thanks, Randy. I don't know that it's quite that simple. I think we need to go back to what Jay was saying earlier about sorting out sense and reference. But just let me say a couple things. You know, my uh, one of my tutors at Oxford, William Newton Smith, said, you know, if you could figure out an adequate theory of verisimilitude, you'd probably win the Nobel Prize on scientific realism. Because at one level, in terms of commensurability, you're saying that an electron in Newton's theory is not the same thing in Einstein's theory, but yet they seem to be similar, right? Or there, there's areas of agreement. So I don't think that the distinction you're making is, is quite accurate. There's, it's much more nuanced and complex than that. And so and I, I think it, we, we need to explore this more, but I would just want to make that particular point. Uh, Joseph? Let, let, me, let me be clear before you go ahead, Joseph. His argument, I don't believe, was that you can't accomplish reference uh, through, through two different descriptions. His argument was that the referent can't be the same if they don't share their properties in common. I think that was the argument. I, I so yep. the, so the, the issue of reference wasn't part of the argument. But in any case, I, go ahead, Joseph. So, uh, Don, do you want to follow up? I, we, I, later. We'll okay. Later, yeah. um, first, first of all, um, let's bear in mind that uh, the heart of the common word uh, is not, hey, we're worshiping the same God. And uh, the Yale response doesn't say that at all. Uh, the heart of the common word <laughs> is, <laughs> what? No. Now, I, I think from the Muslim point of view, you've got this verse in the Quran, ilahuna wa ilahukum wahid, our God and your God is one. So I, I think if you're a Muslim, you have to say Muslims and Christians are worshiping the same God. Although I can assure you there are plenty of Muslim scholars who would disagree and who would say, no, because you deify Jesus Christ, um, you're, you're, or because you have the Trinity, you're not worshiping the same God. But uh, I, I, I think the common word, the Muslim's letter did take the position that we're worshiping the same God. But that was not the heart of the letter. The heart of the letter is we both believe that central to our faith is to love God with all of our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we should put that love for God and each other at the heart of our relations. And uh, this question of whether we worship the same God is an important issue. It's an issue that's valid to address. It's a legitimate concern. But I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the way that uh, the conversation frequently gets uh, derailed onto focusing exclusively on that when the heart of the thing is about putting love for God and each other at the heart of our relationship uh, between Muslims and Christians. Um, second, the Yale response does not say we worship the same God. And um, the phrase, we worship the same God, is, I think, problematic because it can mean different things. It could be understood in, in different ways. 
And in some senses of that phrase, I'd say, yes, we do. In other senses of that phrase, I'd say, uh, no, we don't. Um, uh, certainly, we both seek to worship the one God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's not quite the same thing as saying we are worshiping the same God, um, which is a little bit more complicated of a question. But I'd like to say about what you're, you said and about the, um, the yearbook photo analogy and, the, um, and even a critique of our own analogy to the children of the siblings of the same parent, there is a difference between human <coughs> reference and divine reference <coughs> because there are six and a half billion human beings in the world. And so if John and I were high school, I mean college classmates and we're looking at our old yearbook, we might conceivably discover, oh my goodness, I was talking about this guy and you were talking about that guy. But there's only one creator of the universe. So if we're both talking about the creator of the universe, maybe my understanding of what he's like is right and John's is wrong, or maybe John's understanding of what he's like is right and mine is wrong, or actually maybe both of our understandings of what he's like falls short in some ways. But there are not two different creators of the universe out there that we could be talking about. There's only one creator of the universe we may be understanding him rightly, we may be understanding him wrongly, we may be distorting our understanding of him. We may not really know him, we certainly may not have a saving knowledge of him. But there's only one creator of the universe we could be talking about. and that, So it's not the same as talking about human reference. Um, finally, uh, I think I really liked uh, your reference to Augustine. I was, I was uh, thinking in, in reference to this, uh, another quotation from Augustine where he said, Philosophy taught me that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Philosophy could not teach me that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it seems to me Augustine saying he's recognizing there are non-believers out there who don't know Jesus Christ, who do have an understanding of a God whom he can call God, but they do not have an understanding of, of the revelation of that God in Jesus Christ. And it seems to me Underlying this whole discussion about are we worshiping the same God, when I talk to not so much scholars like this group, but when I talk to ordinary believers in the pew, as it were, uh, the worry is uh, that people are afraid, it, unless I say Muslims are worshiping a different God, I'm afraid I'm affirming that they don't need Jesus to be saved. And I, I think that's a logical non sequitur. I, I think that's two totally different issues. And the vast majority of evangelicals would not say that Jews are worshiping a different God, but they would still say Jews need to know Jesus to be saved. Now, actually, uh, John and Al have both, correct me if I'm wrong, publicly said in response to that question, actually, no, I'm not saying that Jews worship the same God we do, for the same reasons that they've given for saying that they're not prepared to say that Muslims worship. But the vast majority of evangelicals in the pew can handle the idea that Jews are not worshiping a different God, but still need Jesus to be saved. Uh, and I'm not sure why it is that when we're having that conversation about Muslims, people are afraid that unless they say Muslims are worshiping a different God, they're somehow jeopardizing the uniqueness of, of Christ as necessary to salvation. Al. Um, uh, Thank you. I'm appreciating the ongoing discussion here, learning as we go. Uh, I, I am, am perplexed at, at three levels and uh, trying to work through the perplexity. But the, the first level is um, the language about same God or different God wasn't an abstraction. It's actually found within the documents. So it, 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 that was not just drawn out of thin air. It's also implied, I think, very clearly, inescapably, by the content of the question. And uh, so uh, one level of perplexity is how we can talk about uh, same God, different God, knowing God, and at the same time say that somehow God... that one God can be worshipped while at the same time acknowledging that Jesus said that to reject him, to fail to know him, was to fail to know the Father, how one worships what one does not know. That, that, that gets very complicated, and, and that will have to be a different seminar. But I'll say that's one level of perplexity. The second level of perplexity is, and, and, and Joseph, I, I, I just want to press this as, as honestly as I know how, at least the document, the Yale response, seems to imply that there is this shared agreement, same God, same referent. And for instance, the note I read you know, from you earlier, uh, it, it, you know, much of the Yale response presupposes that Muslims and Christians, along with Jews, all seek to worship the one true God. 
For some today, this is a controversial claim. It goes on to suggest that it has not necessarily been so, even if it is true that Muslims and Christians believe in the same God. So now I hear the distinction saying that that's not necessarily what's being affirmed, but it, I'm sorry, it just certainly seems to be affirmed within the text here, or if not, I'm kind of lost as to what this would mean. So clarity would be appreciated here. You know, and, and when it gets to the third perplexity, I'll simply end with this. I am encouraged by the opportunity for conversation. Uh, my response to the Yale response is that I felt it was the wrong response to a common word. There is much in a common word that should elicit a very positive response. The outstretched hand should be met with another outstretched hand. And, and I think it is fundamentally important for our conversation to know what animates us and the fact that each of us is animated by love of God and love of neighbor is very important. That, that does not require what I believe to be the, uh, the disqualifying factor here, which is to imply that love of God means we mean the same thing by God or the same thing by love. And, and when you have to come out and say, no, we don't necessarily mean that, but you say we worship the same God, I just want to say I want to know that my Muslim conversation partner is animated by, by those loves. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm encouraged by that. But that, does not, uh, that does, does not really my responsibility for the cause of the gospel to say, I can't talk about God, I can't talk about love, without talking about the sole, solitary, irreducible, Christological referent. I understand that's not where you're coming from, but you need to know this is where we begin. And, and I'm in John 8 where this begins. And, and you know, I, what I want to say is I don't think the alternatives are the Yale response or no dialogue. And uh, I was just recently in the Muslim world talking with extremely conservative Muslim authorities in a very fruitful conversation in which they, for one, appreciated the clarity that we're talking about right here. Uh, they appreciated my book on the new atheism because, I mean, we found ourselves talking about atheism and Alvin Plantinga and properly basic beliefs in Istanbul, which is a very encouraging thing, is a ground of dialogue. But it didn't require what I see as the concessions that are deadly in the Yale document. Just for the interest of time, I want to let some other people raise some questions here. So please, Josh. There's been 1,452 biographies of Muhammad written in history according to a doctoral thesis in the 90s. This is the earliest biography of Muhammad in Arabic, translated Oxford Press in English. Um, I'm sure you've read the document. Is that correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. In that document, 700, you mean, pages, 700 pages are about warfare and violence and things like that. Weighing in with Christ in his life, in the early Gospels is essential to understanding how we reflect and understand who God is. How do we understand who Muhammad is, given that, for example, in Bukhari, the most authoritative traditions outside of the Quran, which has 149 sword verses in it, con uh, condemns the Christians and the Jews and says they cannot any longer be in Arabia. How is this view in terms of the will of God the same in reflection of God's love of the Great Commission to save people rather than to uh, establish some sort of Islamic state or Sharia in terms of the will of God. I just, I don't want to that, ask that in just a polemical way, but I think that it's important to get historical information about Islamic studies. I only see a, a very s slim view of Islamic studies represented here as opposed to all Islamic scholarship in history, which reflects a very different reading than what I've gone through so in, my, in my research, in my studies. Um. No, I, I, I don't think it's a slim uh, segment of Islamic scholarship. I don't uh, come at this as a... Uh, or you didn't just re refer to the biography of Muhammad. How does that relate to Well, you're holding... First of all, if I say with all due respect, you're holding a very dated um, version of that. I mean, you'd be... Well, I, you, I, I saw... I happened to see the, 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 the title on the table. Um, there's been a lot of scholarship on the biography of the Prophet since then. Um, simply looking at the biography, counting up the pages, and seeing uh, how much of it refers to warfare or something like that is really not the most reliable methodology to sort of come to some conclusion about just how warlike or not warlike Islam is or how the Prophet was. Uh, one has to look at the totality of the tradition. Um, one doesn't, in the Islamic tradition, count up the number of hadith in Bukhari, many of which are repetitive, to see just what the characteristics of the Prophet were as reflected in the books of Bukhari and many of the other hadith. One has to look at the entire tradition, one has to look at the entire Qur'an, one has to look at the entire body of the hadith, 
And when it comes to talking about things like war, when it comes to talk, talking about things like interfaith relations especially, one has to look at the entire body of Islamic law, the four schools of law in Sunni Islam, the Jafari school. And I think um, if you take a, a, a reasonable approach and you look at just what those schools of law say, um, being open to the um, possibility that the political realities don't always reflect the legal injunctions and the authentic teachings of the religion, I think you get a much more complex picture than that, being able to just say it's a slim or it's, it's, it's either it's kind of essentially warlike or something like that. And just to be very specific on this point, even though this is really not what a common word is about, um, uh, the objections that are, and I'll restate what I said before, many of the objections that relate to Islam being uh, somehow warlike and on the other side of the equation Christianity is peaceful, Islam is focused on justice while Christianity is focused, this kind of tabulated version of comparing the two religions. First of all, I think that's, um, uh, that's incorrect. But uh, uh, one has to look at the authoritative teachings and see how it actually plays out. I mean, I can't go into it, but I, do, I sort of don't accept the premises of the question in, in the first place. I think what you're saying, the implication of what you're saying... Was involved in 64 battles? Of course he was involved in 64 battles. I, are there, were, weren't there biblical I, I prophets who were, weren't there, weren't there biblical prophets who were involved in many battles? Uh, the prophet was also, um, there are many, many more hadith about his generosity, about his sacrifice, about him being stoned um, by a population to whom he went to go preach and him beseeching God to uh, be forbearant so that they can receive guidance later. For every single anecdotal incident that you can bring, I can give five other anecdotal incidents. That's really not the way we should go about it. So if you go and you, for example, a book by Sayyid Ramadan Bhuti, on jihad and Islam. Now, Sayyid Ramadan Bhuti is today living one of the top ten most authoritative scholars. You go to Sheikh Ali Juma, again, one of the top ten authoritative scholars, and you can go down the list. Who are the people who Muslims consider to be authoritative? Who are the authoritative interpreters of the law? And see what they say about jihad. I think you'll find a very reasonable picture about just war, about self-defense, about mercy, and about compassion um, that really I can't reflect you know, adequately in just a short comment. But it's the, the proper methodology is not to say, look, I have a bunch of quotations. You have to explain it. You have to go to our tradition and say, what does the authoritative tradition in your tradition, what are people listening to, what do they say? Joseph, would you like to say something? Yeah, I just want to add to that, that actually when you go through the list of all of the different battles that were engaged in and go through all of the Quranic verses, that deal with the issues of war and go through the hadith and again, deal with them in their totality. Um, what you have is a gradual development of a just war theory. It happened in the life of the prophet himself. If there wasn't a, if it wasn't a just war theory, you wouldn't have Christians living in Egypt today, making up over 10% of the population, or living in Lebanon, making up over 30% of the population, they would have been gone a long time ago. So there is, a, there is a deep just war theory that was developed during the life of the prophet. The exigencies of his life, the circumstances that he faced, were indeed far different from those that Jesus faced. There's one instance in particular, the Battle of the Ditch, where if a just war theory had not been developed and applied, we wouldn't be here talking today. There would be no Muslims left on the face of the planet. That would be the end of his community. And it was something by him, and if you actually even go through, one of the fundamentally important things here is that the first verse of the Quran that tells Muslims to fight, tells them to defend mosques, churches, synagogues, where in the name of God is remembered. The reason, the reason to take this up is not simply for the spread of this particular faith and this particular empire. It is to defend those who wish to remember and worship God, be they Christian, Muslim, or Jew, from those who wish to prevent them from worshiping God. Yes. I'd like to ask Joseph, uh, any big mistakes you regret in all the work? Uh, I, for example, I've written three books on Islam. I think it's a total waste of time. Uh, you have to do it in a way, but it's very unproductive to talk about whether we worship the same God. 
Because you know, in the end, some Wesleyans are going to say they don't worship the same God as a Calvin. So I, I worry about that. But any big mistakes? And then to Al and John, I'd like to ask, in your response to Yale, do you think you overstated and didn't recognize how incredible it is that uh, uh, rather than a, a war clash of civilizations or clash of religions, we're actually going to talk? Uh, well, I've already acknowledged that if I could go back and redo one thing in the actual text of the Yale response, it would be that one phrase that John uh, interprets differently from me. Um, but I, I, if I said the, the biggest mistake I think we've made in the process, um, I guess it would be that I think we've brought together top-tier leaders, the elite scholars and senior leaders of the two uh, of, 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 of Islam and Christianity, uh, we've not done a good job of um, involving ordinary believers in mosques and churches um, in, in a process uh, where, where they're talking to each other and they're having similar conversations. Um, and uh, after the first Common Word Conference at Yale, we had big dreams of doing that, and uh, we had donors ready to support that financially, and then, of course, the stock market crashed at that very time, and those plans went out the window. I wish that we had planned that right from the very start uh, and put that into the fabric right from the very start, um, and I hope that in the future um, that, that, that we can move it from the elite uh, to something that involves ordinary believers uh, in, in talking with each other. Um. No, I, I don't think I've overstated anything. Um, and if you're inferring that what I said diminishes the importance of dialogue, you're inferring wrongly. My question is, and I was, is why there needs to be a theological common ground in order to have dialogue. I, <clears throat> I listed, this would be the things I think we need to have in order to have a conversation. Common language, got to understand each other. We're both human. Number three, we both desire truth. Number four, we desire that each other's salvation. Number five, we desire peace. Number six, we desire understanding. I want you to understand me. I want to understand you better. And we desire that both be represented. And I'm, this list could go on and on. Why isn't that enough in order to get together? Why, why do we have to have a common understanding of Love for God. Why, 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 why do you have to say we love the same God or, or anything? Why, why, why? I don't understand the project. It, uh, <coughs> what, 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 yeah, 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 or whatever. There's a response to that. Yes. Just, just. Can I, I actually, I don't, I don't need the microphone. I just want to say, I do think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding of the project on one level because <coughs> while these things are proposed, when we come out with the document, I mean, it was known, we, uh, both Janera and I were involved in talking with Prince Ghazi before the document came out, before they even went out and got signatories to it. The idea was that it would evolve. <clears throat> now, the idea is not necessarily that people are all going to be converted, but it's the idea that this will happen. It, this, is, this is the project. The project is that we'll get together, that I will hear what John Piper has to say, that I'll really get a much better understanding of the Christocentric nature of his belief and what that really fully implies. And I have. And I hope that he too will get a better understanding of what I mean when I talk of the love of God. And this is part of the peace, the peace initiative that's implied here. And it's because only when these communities actually come together and know one another can we then have people who are in a position who are actually in dialogue with one another to prevent the more extreme elements from trying to stir, shall we say, the middle ground from, being, uh, from becoming fanatically opposed to one another. And that's where the peace initiative comes. And that's why it's so important that you have these world leaders of these faiths as being engaged in this particular discourse so that their understanding of one another will be refined, and we'll have objections, we'll have disagreements, but we'll know what the disagreements are. And my, and what I, what I used to imagine 
or the disagreements and the oppositions that Christians have towards me is no longer what I'm going to think, but I'm going to know exactly what their positions are. And what they used to imagine was my position is no longer what they're going to think. And then we really can get together and solve some crucial yes. issues and prevent the radicalization of our communities. Don? I, I think, I mean, that, that sums it up for me as well in many respects. I mean, my goal with this panel from the outset as I talked with Joseph and others, and I've been involved in this now for four or five years and came at it from a, from a philosophical standpoint originally, but it ended up being a very practical issue for me in working with people. I remember being in a hermeneutics conference on Islam where someone who's turned out to be a good friend now was, I'd asked him to speak. We're going to have a Yale-wide conference eventually for students just to talk about what is Islam and what is Christianity. It was apparent at that conference by both sides saying, you know what, we don't really understand each other's faith. What's A lot of Christians don't know. I mean, you get, you get to know your own faith better when you have to analyze it in light of other truths, right, or when you're teaching a subject, and that became apparent. And at that conference, one of the speakers was talking about Christians and going to hell, and it was, I'm sitting there going, you know, I don't know what they believe, and I don't think they understand what I believe. And when I asked Yasser to speak at this conference, who's a, he's a, a PhD student at Yale and actually a well-known Muslim scholar, he said, Don, I can't do that because I, I think all Christians are going to hell. And I said, Yasser, we're, we're, in, we're in agreement. We're there. I mean, not that all Christians are going to hell, but there, <laughs> there's a fact of the matter about the faith, right? You believe this, and I believe this. Now, one of us is right, and one of us is wrong, or we're possibly both wrong, but we can't both be right to go to uh, Randy's position. We, we, they're not identical, right? But we can dialogue about this, and, and, we, can, and we can talk about it. And he, after that, he was all on board, and we're good friends to this day, although we have very different positions. And my goal was it, is, to, is to, to be able to discuss these issues. I very much wanted Dr. Piper and Dr. Muller here because I respect them, and I think we need to have a dialogue on this. I remember at the workshop we were talking and about how new things were coming up and new understandings because we had this about evangelicals and what was going on. And I thought the more that we can have these kinds of discussions, and, and there's clear fundamental disagreements just on the nature of the dialogue itself, right? Whether it's the right dialogue or whether there should be a different dialogue. I mean, ultimately, I, I think it is a starting point. It is a place that we can have a discussion. And I think part of that disagreement centers on the Muslims come at it from a very different starting point than, than the Christians did. And, in our, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joseph, but in formulating the Yale response, we could have corrected a lot of that where we might have thought it was different or we moved ahead with it where we thought we understood it and, and tried to respond in kind, notwithstanding this one particular issue of, of disagreement, right? And I have other issues with the document, too, about how it might have been crafted. And I think, you know, we could, we could talk on about those or we can use some sense of a document or perhaps talking about a different way to do the dialogue to move forward. Perhaps John's suggestions just now about what, what are some similarities that we can talk about without the nature of God. But we can continue the dialogue and move it forward in a way that can help us to understand. I mean, clearly in the news today, these are issues, right? I mean, I, I, whether it's the Fort Hood shootings, which no one's brought up, or what's been going on, or how people have responded, these are things we have to talk about as Christians. Recently, I was at Dallas at a capital campaign for the Rivendell Institute where I work, and I used to teach there. I was a singles pastor there, as well as going to seminary there, and I know a lot of people. And one of the guys I was talking to was a prominent evangelical leader in Dallas. And at the time, I wasn't uh, kind of above, uh, what I was doing in this dialogue wasn't kind of in a public square, right? But he just went off on Muslims in a very negative and pejorative way. Partly he was kidding, but partly he was serious. And I thought, you know, do I say anything to this guy or do I just let it go? And I thought, well, I'm going to dive in. So an hour and a half later, you know, without going into all the particulars, he says, you know, Don, one thing you were right about, I wasn't, I wasn't handling this right. I wasn't being loving in how I was talking to people. And so, you know, in a, when we talk about these things at the academic level, that's one thing. But out in the practical world, we have to lead with our faith and lead with our love. And we're going to influence people in how we do this, no matter what our particular position is about how we see the nature of God. Um, that's critical. But acting out that faith and practicing 1 Corinthians 13 here, I think, is huge in terms of moving things forward. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on some of the things that... Um, 
uh, uh, Joseph was saying about a common word in term, and, and also in the way of responding to John Piper as to why, why do it that way? Why have it be a question of trying to find some kind of theological common ground as opposed to just saying, look, we all want the same thing. Like, why, why take it to the next step? You know, we can say that we're human, that we want peace, and so, which is all true. I mean, there's nothing, certainly nothing wrong with that, and there's certainly nothing wrong with trying to establish some kind of dialogue on that basis. But um, having um, sort of been witness to the, to, the, to the initiative, as it were, from, from the ground floor, um, uh, what I would say is that the, the logic, the whole, the, whole uh, the reason why you would structure it in this way is because this, of the idea of accountability, the idea of mutual accountability that, that I, that from that quote I had of Prince Kazi earlier. That is to say, it's very difficult, given the international situation that, and the fact that religious leaders around the world are inescapably, I mean, they can't extricate themselves from also being politically uh, sensitive. You know, they're always, as it were, sitting on top of a, uh, a powder keg. You know, if you're a religious leader in m many p places of the world, you're sitting on top of a barrel of gunpowder. So you have to be very careful in the way in which you proceed. There are many things inwardly that you would like to express in terms of commonality with the other religion and so forth, but you can't do it. So for example, uh, the tradition of Sufism, the mystical tradition in Islam, is absent from the document. Many of the uh, various doctrinal formulas are absent from the document. Why? Because of the sensitivity of reaching out to Christians. So what does the structure of trying to find common theological ground do? It says, look, we are not coming from a point of weakness. We are coming from a point of strength. We invite you to come from a point of strength. That is to say, you are not standing on your human two feet and saying, I want this and I want that, and it's just me desiring to have dialogue with these people over there. No, we're saying that we are compelled from our own scriptural tradition to enter into this dialogue in the way that we're doing. So we're identifying what we think you are supposed to do in the Bible. And we are trying to also say we, according to the Quran, are also supposed to do this. Now you might think this, it's not immediately uh, um, apparent why that's important. It's important because it protects the dialogue from outside criticism. It protects it from the radicals and the extremes who say, oh, they're just trying to give away the farm. They're just, uh, they're just collaborators with the enemy. They're naive and they're stupid and they don't understand what's going on, on the other side. It's a way of establishing a platform that's, um, as it were, unimpeachable, indestructible. Who's going to object when I say, that? well, the Quran tells me to do it? Well, it's hard to say something against. It's hard to tell a Christ Christian you're naive and stupid when he's basing it on an authentic reading of the Bible or on, a, on authentic Christian teachings on, on that tradition. That's a very important element of it. It's, it's, I think it's the reason why it's been so successful. It's the reason why it's caught like fire and people are just doing it spontaneously in different parts of the world. That's, that's I want to Thank you. Add yes, Al. And then you know, uh, I was asked three questions. I'm going to try to answer them quickly. I know we're out of time. First of all, do I believe that I overstated the case? No. But that's a good question. And, and quite frankly, given the amount of time that's passed since this first emerged, I wanted to go back. I, I, I tried to read it as if I've never read these documents before. And I was helped by the fact that there have been many subsequent clarifications that have been issued that enabled me to look at it further. Uh, and to be honest, uh, my concerns were amplified, not diminished in that process, but essentially the same. The second question is, you know, how, how far do we take this in terms of, uh, the, of who knows the Father and who does not? I, I would say it's Christological and Trinitarian, period. That's why in the great schism between East and West, even where there was a, a difference over the precise definition of the Trinity, uh, there was no suggestion that uh, either did not r rightly know the Father through the Son. The same thing in the anathemas of the Reformation. Uh, do Calvinists and, and uh, Arminians believe in a different God? No. And, and we must be very careful to say that. And I think we do in very many different ways. Some of my best friends are Arminians. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's, just, that, that's just not where we're going to go. We could eventually say, you know, what about the dispensationalists and the, you know, the non-dispensationalists? Uh, obviously, that's not where we go for good reason, so we can, we can move past that. Uh, it is Christological and Trinitarian. And then the, the third, dialogue. Am I not happy the dialogue is taking place? I came a long way to have this dialogue, and I'm happy to do so. And I'm honored by the opportunity to do so, precisely with the people who are on this panel with me. Uh, I've been very, very uh, honored by respectful dialogue with Muslims around the world. And, uh, and that did not require this document. It's not to say the document doesn't afford us a good opportunity for further conversation, but uh, it doesn't all hang on 
this particular document, nor the Yale response, nor in our response to the Yale response, nor to the response that will come to our response to the Yale response, <laughs> this begins a conversation I really do trust will continue and must. Joseph. Well, uh, first of all, I want to say uh, I really agree with Al that um, knowing God is Trinitarian and Christological. I totally agree with you. And um, in, actually, in the paper that I presented, which was the very first paper at the, at the first conference, which, as I said, is in the book, uh, basically, I said that when a Christian says God is love, not just that God is loving, but that God is love, we mean Trinity. We may not say the word Trinity, but to say God is love is to speak of the Trinity. To say that God is love toward a created human race is to speak of incarnation. And to say that God is love toward a sinful human race is to speak of the cross. That's basically what I said in my paper. So I really agree with you on that. And, um, and I think that um, underlying the, the, um, the worry about um, are we worshiping the same God or different God, and I, I do think the best way to put it is we are all seeking to worship the one God who created the universe, which is, which is not the same as saying different God and not the same as saying same God. Um, I, I think that underlying that for evangelicals is the concern, are we doing anything to undermine the uniqueness of Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation? And I certainly want to be very clear that I do not want to do anything to undermine the uniqueness of Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. And I do not believe that the Yale response does that. Um, and um, among the Muslim signatories of the original common word letter, there are some who believe that they would like to see us all converted to Islam and others who do not. In fact, Prince Ghazi himself, I think, is quite strongly opposed to proselytism in either direction. Uh, but he found himself uh, surrounded by sheikhs at the, at the conference at Yale, who most of whom said, hey, we want to proselytize the Christians and let the Christians proselytize us as long as it's a level playing field and, and, uh, and nobody's abusing their power or, or, or wealth. Um, but so you've, you've got, on the Muslim side, people who would like to see us converted and others who do not want to see us converted. You have Muslims like Yasser, whom, uh, who would say, you're going to hell unless you embrace Islam. And others, like I think Joseph Lombard would say, uh, you're saved. You don't need to convert to Islam to be saved eternally. Uh, the same is true on the Christian side. Obviously, there was the usual suspects of uh, World Council of Churches types who, who signed the Yale response, who um, you know think everybody's saved. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know I believe that you need Jesus to be saved. Um, and uh, those of us who actually drafted the Yale response, believe you need Jesus to be saved. Um, on the other hand, that's not what this letter was about. This, neither the Muslim's letter to us nor our response was about, uh, you've got to get converted in order to be saved. Uh, we were not taking a position one way or the other on that. Needless to say, we've had some very fruitful conversations uh, when we're sitting down together face to face. Uh, uh, my Muslim friends telling me why Islam is wonderful and why Muhammad is the seal of the prophets and me telling my Muslim friends why I think Jesus is a wonderful savior. And uh, well, they haven't become Christians and I haven't become a Muslim, but <laughs> I, I think we've been able to, to listen to each other and understand each other and that neither of us has compromised on our convictions. And I guess that's where I want to leave it, is that I, I think what we have done, intended to do and did do in the Yale response and intended to do and have done in the process launched by the exchange of letters is to have a conversation where we're talking honestly about these issues, frankly and cordially, without compromising our core convictions, whether it be unique Islamic convictions about the Prophet Muhammad or unique Christian convictions about Jesus as the only uh, way to come to a saving knowledge of the Father. Uh, let's uh, thank our panelists and for a good... <laughs> I appreciate your work.